So <clears throat> this is Bath, the transition from uh, to this modern workplace and work from home, and how did Bath, Bath transition to uh, a remote workplace? Um, today, Chuck and I have been asked to present this. Um, I will be presenting the first 20, 25 minutes in regards to from the technology standpoint, how that is delivered. Uh, after that, I will transition it over to Chuck, who will do a little bit more on the apps and the use cases. Chuck, he is responsible as the VP of Business Development for Bass, uh, responsible for management of strategic sales and initiatives, new client acquisition and customer plans and satisfaction. And at the end of December, Chuck, it'll be 15 years I've been working with you, 15 years. Uh, so I understand, I think 15 years. The gift is crystal, so if I'm just hinting, that's maybe what you should be getting me or thinking about looking at. I'll do my best for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So a little less about Chuck and what he's doing for myself. My name is Jamie Smith. I'm the president of Lineco. I manage the infrastructure and IT division here for Bass. We work out of the same offices as Bass, uh, providing support services for ourselves internally. We're a full-fledged MSP, an IT support service company. Um, what does this mean? We have our, our customers and clients that we provide IT to. We have, uh, they have over 3,000 employees. Uh, we support over 500 servers. Uh, we currently support over 450-ish or something like that of hosted uh, Sage 300 for customers, supporting their servers. Uh, and to do that, we have 20 IT staff currently in our department here, uh, supporting all of them, as well as the more than 140 people in the Bass group of companies. And of course, that's obviously coast to coast, east to west. Uh, and with our customers, we also have uh, staff and employees in locations working out of places like Mexico, the Middle East, Europe, the Caribbean, and China. So this whole work from home thing and working remote, um, we've been doing and practicing it for quite a considerable time. But what I have never seen is what's happened this year in this sudden and mass exodus of workforce from in the office in one direction, which is out, to suddenly be required to work remotely. So this was certainly a, a big change and a tidal wave that happened very quickly. Um, in our session today, if you have any questions from or for Chuck or I, I am not going to take a break during a transition from my presentation to Chuck. We will not be doing questions that we're going to do it at the very end. So please do submit them and if uh, time permitting, uh, we will do our very best to answer any questions that you've uh, sent over to us. Thank you. Um, back to what's happened. So March 16th, this is when this whole work from home thing um, really happened. And um, we saw this sudden rush to deploy for our customers to enable work from home. And in a two week to three week period, we saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of users that we had to move. Uh, and previously, these people had, uh, had no work from home allowance. And suddenly, they had moved to only work from home or the majority is work from home. And we had have these requests uh, all come in during the short time period for the, for the enablement. Uh, and we can categorize them. Look, at the first thing that people were doing is how do we get hardware for home? And I don't know for uh, you uh, and your organizations, but you may have felt this in that Hardware wasn't available at that time. Laptops and things were sold out, period. So then they wanted us to uh, suddenly transition. Well, how do you have, enable them to work from home using their PCs? Um, so now we've got their computers and personal computers that they need to be able to use. And how do we secure them? And then how do we access files for these people enabling? And then getting them into the office, how do they get access to their Sage 300, their ACPAC, their ERP solutions? And then, of course, how do they communicate with each other? How do they communicate with one another? And how do they commu communicate with customers? How do they answer the phones? How do they receive these messages? How are they gonna be able to do this? So putting all of those things together in a very short time period back then, I can tell you that a lot of the steps that were done in the short term to enable that, we've gone back and revisited and customers have wanted to go back and revisit, hey, how do we do this in a more organized fashion? If we haven't done this in some permanence, how do we make this and implement something that is going to be good for the long term of it, long term of this? So the actions we put back toge uh, together for, for many people and companies back in March and April weren't necessarily the long term solutions. They've circled back, what is it more permanent? So that brings me to 
how is it that BAS dealt with this exact same thing? How did we trans either transform or enable this work from home and remote workplace? And that's what we're here to discuss today. And I will do this from a technology standpoint. Is there a proper way to do this? Or what is it that BAS did to enable this? Um, you know, what are the questions and what are the commonalities between us? And how did we make this work? For ourselves, in enabling that work from home and to access all the tools that we require, we certainly are no different than you. We have the same questions, comments, concerns, and requirements. So here we will get a top level portion of conversation of, hey, how is that actually done from a technology standpoint? And it really starts with, let's organize what it is that's required. What did we need to be able to deliver out to our staff and employees to enable them to be able to, be able to work from home? So with 100, again, 140 plus staff across Canada, uh, everybody working from home, but they still need access to all of our tools. And what we, we wanna start to do here is list out what are the commonly required items for our own internal use, for our own company? Um, what is it that they need? And then how do we design and align that design to enable them to be able to work from home? Um, for Bass, we can certainly, we can summarize that what we would need to be able to work from home and from any remote location is access into our Sage 300, access into our Sage CRM, which is our professional services automation tool for time entry, uh, marketing, uh, sales, et cetera, and access to our file shares. So, if, you know, you would consider those to be our file servers. How do we get access onto our forms and things like that? How do we communicate? Um, how do we communicate with our customers? How do we take and ingest those phone calls that are coming, coming in? How do we make the calls out? And not only that, but how do we communicate with each other internally? How do we make this as easy and seamless as possible for everybody who are all in these disparate locations? And how do we provide what hardware is going to be required to enable everybody to be able to work from anywhere? So from a technology support standpoint, these are really the common areas and requirements uh, that are universal across customers, our customer base, as well as ourselves internal. And I would suggest that you start, this is where the questions start and where the answers start to come in. So we want line of business applications, we want our files, we want our communications, and we want our hardware. So let's get started and go through these one at a time to see what BAS did or has done to fill the need for each one of these. And the first one, let's, we're gonna show ERP, we'll show file shares and we'll comms and tools. Let's start with our ERP. So on the ERP or C and CRM side of it, um, I, and I'll refer to these commonly as line of business applications. We're gonna state the obvious here. Uh, here at Bass, we use Sage 300 and Sage CRM. And so with that requirement, the same tools and same softwares that you have, how is it that we enable our own locations and employees to work from anywhere and from home to be able to get access to them? And we use, uh, the for the ERP and the CRM, we put it in a colo and we host it in our same Bass Cloud solution that we would deliver out to anybody. And we deliver that using remote desktop services. So by hosting our Sage 300 and our CRM in a colo, and I, I'm not going to get into the infrastructure or how it's done there, other than to say in the concepts, we don't put this in our own offices. We host this in a tier three co-location facility in Mississauga with you know, geo redundancies and backup security and things like that. That's a different story, but let's start with the premise that you put it in a location like that and use remote desktop services to access your ERP so that you can get access to it from anywhere. So even when we are inside the office prior to, the, prior to what's happened this year, so for, for years now, we have had our Sage 300 in the colo and delivering it via remote desktop services to people even within our office so that they had the opportunity from any office location to get into it. From within the office, they're accessing it the same way as they would from anywhere else. And from outside of the office, they access it the same way. And so when this thing happened in March with COVID, there was no change for our employees. The, their ability or their method of getting into this solution was the exact same as it was previously. For CRM, we do the exact same thing. I won't get into it again, but the co-location facility itself, but we host it in a colo in Mississauga in the same facility. And therefore people have access to it from the operations side and the PSA side of it 
into this from anywhere. If you have internet, you can get access. And yes, I am asked this all the time. Would I recommend this deployment stall to everyone? And I say yes, regardless. Uh, even if you're installing it within your own office um, and not in a co-location facility, you should you could absolutely do this, and I would strongly suggest you do this. So now, having done this, everybody in our office has access to the ERP. They have access to the CRM. Um, they connect with the same way that they did from within the office, now outside of the office, so there's no change there. They use remote desktop services, uh, which provide access to the ERP. And it, it that is a reminder to everybody, that is not something that's just for us. This is a core Microsoft product that everybody can use. You can maybe notice terminal services previously, remote desktop service and delivering your ERP. Any of you can use this. And um, we've gotten just a little bit more fancy and slick and and how it is that we deliver it, but you could do this as well. And we were removed by doing this. Uh, it's it's turnkey, it's the exact same inside of the office, outside of the office. And with that, we've removed the requirement to install Sage 300 on anybody's desktop. So when something like this happens, if somebody didn't have a laptop provided and they went home, they're able to access the ERP through the web, through RDS, as if they were in the office. Again, removing any requirement on the client side of it. So for those of you that don't have something like that currently in place, and I can say that you know, back March, April, when we were doing this, we see, saw a lot of customers were either hastily trying to move to something like this, or quite often what they were doing is they were taking their home PCs and remoting into their work PCs where the ERP was installed and be able to get access to it, where they were using remote tools to get into their work PCs. And it's a little slow and jagged and obviously cumbersome and not as, as uh, fluid as this, but at least they would do it. And now we're getting people circling back to do something. Like this. So I would say to you and suggest to you, if you have not already, now is the time, look at deploying your Sage 300 software via remote desktop services. Speak to your IT support, ask them what would it be required to do something like that. And of course, obviously we're here to help us if we can as well. Please reach out to a Bass account manager and then we'd be more than happy to reach back out to you to go over how this works as well. And just a quick screen of, this is how we get into it. Go to a web page, log in, authenticate, boom, click on your Sage 300 and there you've got it. It doesn't get you know too much easier than that. So now that we've got that, another aspect that we would need, we have people with access into their ERP and their CRM, what else do they need? They need access to their file shares. So on the file share side of it, we traditionally consider this, these to be the map drives within your office that point to different file shares by department, assumedly. You know, you've got different security groups and things for people to access into. And if you've got that in the office, really what you're trying to do is provide secure access by department to Excel and PDF and Word documents, things that you consider to be the business needs. You want people to be able to work on them and potentially collaborate and share with each other. You want them to be secure and in your office. So we have, we're no different than you. How do we do this? How do we give everyone access to departmental file shares while they work from home or work from anywhere? And what we use, we use Microsoft Teams and SharePoint. Uh, so we use Microsoft Teams for our share, uh, file sharing and access. Um, this is just a, another, you know, Microsoft Teams to me is just another fancy word for Office 365 or now it's M365. Uh, it's all a cl cloud-based file sharing tool so that with it, everyone can have access into the files that they require, whether they're in the office or outside of the office. So within the office, there, there aren't file servers. We're putting everything into SharePoint, accessing it via Microsoft Teams so that we have access to our file shares. Um, do this by installing the Microsoft Teams client on our own computers, on our laptops. And therefore, when I take my laptop into the office, I'm opening up the same application to get access to my file shares and channels and departments as I would from when I take my laptop home or when I take my laptop if I'm going away in a conference or things like that to be able to have access to all of these anywhere. Uh, and if I've got internet, I've got access into all of their file shares. So we've used Teams, again, to replace our file shares. We've created these channels for the different departments so that everybody has access. Uh, we're, uh, the added benefits of things like this is we're able to collaborate on documents in real time. Um, also, by saving them into here, no matter where you are, there's 
it's not saving on the local machine. Everything's being backed up or synchronized into the cloud into Microsoft 365. So we've given access, we've given also the security to it, and we've um, uh, provided that it's centrally stored and accessible. So that you know you lose your laptop, you install Teams again, and you've got access into all of your file shares. So if you don't have something like this, what we found when this COVID crisis happened and people are working from home quite often again, they were A, remoting into their machine at the office to get access to shares at the office, or B, as implementing VPNs from their home so that they could pick up files off of the file servers. Old style, old world. If you want to really future-proof this, look at a file a cloud-based file sharing tool. There are a few different you know, ones that are very common out there. We use Office 365 with SharePoint and Microsoft Teams. It's an add-in to our existing Office 365 email tenant, nothing to it, just adding it on and migrated our file shares there. So that's how we've enabled our own staff to access this file shares. So, so far, out of the requirements that we have, the major required group areas that we've got for our staff and what do they need to be able to work from home, we've covered line of business applications through our hosting. We covered file shares through Microsoft Teams. And what's next? Communications. So on communication tools, when I say communication tools, what I'm really talking about here is um, chat, instant message, video conferencing, telephones. And of course, you have to categorize them and use them both internally and externally. And what I mean by that was talking with people inside our office, within our own group and then talking with customers. So to do things, something like that, uh, for me, my concern is the ability to, how do we communicate, like first and foremost, communicating consistently with customers? How do we are still able to do that while allowing our people to be able to work from home? How do we receive a phone call, have an operator answer it? Have you dial an extension to still be able to reach a person? Um, how do we get people to be able to call out and still be able to reach uh, customers? So for me on that side of it, um, we've, you know, to me, it's, it's easy. You pick a VoIP phone solution. That's what we have. We have combined our communication tools for our customers is go to connect and go to meeting. Um, you can go out there and search yours. If you're using Zoom for, for meet web meetings and things, pick a VoIP service provider. We've combined it both into one. To, to, to have that integration and ease of access and integration into Outlook for calendaring and invites and things like that. One user GUI and interface, it's always better to get you know multiple ven uh, multiple items into one vendor. So that's who we use, pick your own, but we use GoToConnect for a VoIP hosted phone system so that people can call into our office, dial an extension, you can get me and I can pick it up at my la off of my laptop, off of my headset, and I can dial out so that we can still run operations and support. And then for internally, it's slightly different. Um, a lot of that communication has to do uh, like chat and instant messaging. You want to be able to communicate it to somebody. Hey, but there's so many different methods. I could be on the phone. I could be in a web meeting. I could be doing emails. I could be busy during to do my work. We want to be able to use IM through chat, through Microsoft Teams. Say, hey, uh, are you busy? Can I give you a quick call? Or can you meet with me on a subject or things like that? We also then want to be able to, once we've done that, communicate with each other. Sure, I could use our VoIP phone system and things to call out to the different extensions, and absolutely that's valid and we're capable of doing that. But quite often now, we just through Microsoft Teams, click and call or click and do a video chat or click and create a meet an instant meeting and schedule it out. So we use Teams internally for, for uh, our chat communication and meetings and video conferencing just like this. So, If we've got line of business applications, we've got our file shares and we've got our communication, the next one would be how do we get these delivered out to people and what hardware are they gonna be required? I'm going to skip hardware and I'm gonna to go to a different direction in security here, simply because on the hardware, it's very plain Jane. I think we can all you know, understand it. Um, hardware is an easy topic. My suggestion and strong suggestion to you is to provide laptops to all users, no matter what. When you're onboarding and you have computers now, and when you have computer refreshes that you are doing for your company, don't consider desktop towers anymore. Just do laptops, period. Um, this allows you to have extend your security and your ownership and management of those devices outside of your office. And you can put governorship on it. And it, it allows you to enable your employees to be able to 
future-proof and be able to work from home and work from anywhere. And this is what we've done. Laptops out to everybody. One thing that we have done here that is a, a change and a change in progress for us is we always considered our consultants and uh, op staff and sales to require laptops. I'll be darned if I did, I wasn't really thinking about accounting and back office. No, they're always going to be in the office. No, they're always going to require PCs. They're always going to be here. That's absolutely not true. We've, I've found that out myself here through this. And we have now gone to that stance of, hey, no matter what the staff, no matter what the position, make it laptops. Even though in the finance department there, you, you're always saying, hey, look at the chances of us requiring that or needing that or slim and we're always going to need to come in the office once a balloon or something. Now it's really opened up to, no, let's get them laptops. It's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And now and with what's happened, obviously, that, that's even more so. We want them to be able to, hey, look, at work from home three days a week or four days a week or switching out on the timing and coming into the office, et cetera. And we can provide them with this laptop as a tool to be able to do that in the finance team. But back to the security and the subject at hand here, which is I can't, uh, I can't stress enough um, when – we all know with this, with work from home and work from outside of the office, we've really stretched out the limits uh, and exposures that we have uh, to security issues. So items here that we commonly don't see out there being practiced, I, would, I can't strongly stress enough. Obviously you've got to have passwords and strong passwords, but put in multi-factor authentication, put in two-factor authentication. We see this all the time, especially in Office 365 with organizations that haven't implemented it yet. I can't stress enough, put it in place. It is what prevents brute forcing and password breach. If somebody has that, they still can't get in. What is 2FA? When you log into an application or you log into something from a foreign like device that isn't recognized, it should message you on your phone or on your 2FA device with a pop-up that says, like for if it's Duo or Microsoft Authenticator, it'll say, hey, did you just log in and do you want to allow this? And you have to press okay before you let it in, or it gives you a six digit pin that you have to enter before it'll let you get any further. So we have 2FA in our remote desktop services. Um, we have 2FA in our Office 365. I can't stress enough, please do put something like that in place. And if you're not sure if you've got it in, you probably don't speak to your IT people. Uh, with the 2FA in Office 365, there's also an add-on called Advanced Threat Protection for Office 365. Go speak to your IT people. This is the spam filters, link filters, et cetera. But in AT, there's different categories, ATP1, ATP2. There's Azure AD, P1, and P2. As you move up the stack, they provide more advances. And some of those more advances that we really find incredibly useful are understanding uh, accounts at risk and event notifications that tell us, hey, an account, you know, I'm not so interested in uh, breach attempts in our Office 365 and email because if I was to look at those reports every day, we're looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of attempts every single day to breach in and brute force our email. Uh, it's, it's just a fact and it's common and we're not alone. Everybody, this is happening to everybody. Whether you know it or not, it's happening to you. It's whether or not you look at the reports to find it out. My comfort zone is going to be, I don't necessarily look so much at the breach attempts. I want to see, hey, who actually logged in but failed to a factor authentication? Those are the alerts that I want. Those are going to come into our support desk to let us know that, hey, potentially we've got a user here with a breached account, and you better go check in on that. All right, so 2FA, obviously then past that, have managed security solutions, antivirus, detection and response on your endpoint. Speak to your IT people, speak to those IT department. Just make sure that these are monitored and managed by them and seen in real time in a console, and it's not left up to your end user to report that they clicked on something and their antivirus picked it up and stopped it. Make sure it's centralized, okay? So I'm running out of my time here. At a very high level, let's recap this. What have we done for BAS? For our hosted, or sorry, for our line of business applications, what we've done is Sage 300 and Sage CRM. We host that in our colo. We deliver it out by remote desktop services. For our fraud shares, we use Office 365 via Microsoft Teams. For communications tools, we use a VoIP solution and meeting solution from GoToMeeting. Uh, and then for an internal, we use, uh, use Microsoft Teams as well. Uh, and uh, don't forget, laptops, no desktops when you're future-proofing your organization and 2FA, security, 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 okay? Um, if any of this, and this is just very high level, is any interest to anybody out there and they want just a little deeper dive, on the 26th of November, um, we're doing a session just on this from a technology standpoint, and it's navigating the modern workplace. 
We have six sessions starting from 12 to four. They're 25 minutes each, just much like just like these. We've got two on budgeting. We've got uh, file collaboration, access to app security and breach planning. The two on budgeting are done by James Liutri, our VP of professional services. And C he, um, he provides CIO services uh, for our customers and he does road mapping and technology mapping. Um, so he's worked in, he's, a, he's a, been a manager of IT, a product manager for a very large dynamics uh, and CRM VARs, a director of ops for another MSP, director of technology in the government sector. So we're currently very fortunate to have him here and his experience to deliver these roadmaps to our customers. And he's gonna walk through the two different phases on the budgeting, the first one being assessing the current state and then your needs, and then from those needs, wants and goals, producing the second act, act, which is the future state guideline file collaboration. We'll go a little bit more to Teams. Access to apps, I will go over the hosting solution that we do for our Bass Cloud solution. I'm not there to sell that solution. I'm there to educate what it is and how we do it. You can take this exact same information and go back to your own infrastructure and IT people and say, hey, look at how does that compare to what we were thinking and would like to do? This is just an open forum session on how it's done. The uh, security, same on that. And then on breach planning, I will give some um, real world cases that we've seen of uh, people that are breached and what happens after it and the actions that need to take place, as well as don't forget you must and should have a breach plan in for your cybersecurity insurance because they don't want you to just try to prevent issues. They need you to print plan in that for what happens when you are breached and how do you recover. All right. So if anything in there is of interest, please do check out and sign up uh, off the BAS website under events for the Thursday, November 26. And with that, I will pass this back to Remington who can please pass this over to Chuck and Chuck. Thank you very much. The forum is all yours. Thank you very much, Jamie. And I just want to make sure that I am sharing my correct screen. You are so. not. You are in the preview mode. You've got to share the other one. Perfect. And how does that look? That looks perfect. That is a beautiful picture of you. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Jamie. I appreciate uh, you sharing all of that with us. Unfortunately, I did miss some of your earlier presentation, and uh, that was due to the fact that you reminded me about our 15-year anniversary. So I spent some time on Google and Amazon trying to find something that I felt was just satisfactory, <laughs> actually better than that, uh, just to really represent our last 15 years together. So Much appreciated. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Terrific. So uh, Jamie has spent a lot of time sharing with you the technology, the infrastructure that was required uh, in place to be able to uh, transition our workforce uh, to be able to access the applications in the new remote environment. So what I'm going to focus on is talking about how we use the applications and, and how we needed to adapt our applications to be able to uh, allow for the remote workforce to be able to do their job, to be able to meet the uh, expectations of our customers and really just not drop the ball and be able to do so. But as you know, Jamie talked about the fact that he hadn't seen anything like this, I certainly haven't uh, as well. You know, I kind of reflect back on Y2K and the, um, the potential change that that meant for a lot of different organizations. And, and it really, um, you know, it, it was huge in the sense that we may have had to change a lot of our applications, specifically ERP because of the Y2K issue, but we had kind of months and years to actually prepare for this. And with this COVID pandemic, we really have only had uh, a couple of weeks initially to adjust. So nothing like that uh before so i just wanted to remind everybody that if you do want to ask us questions again to use the question panel on your application and jamie and i will respond to those in the end so uh you know we talked uh jamie talked a bit about the infrastructure and things that we've had in place and and we really we were ready to a degree for the pandemic and that's because back in about 2006 we actually uh, had acquired a business, actually two businesses that allowed us to expand into multiple offices. And with that, we had to begin figuring out how we were going to deploy our 
our business applications out to our workforce in these multiple locations. And we also took on some remote users, in other words, home-based users as well. So uh, we were, uh, you know, in all intents and purposes, we thought we were ready for this situation. But uh, no doubt, uh, as Jamie mentioned, our finance administration team uh, wasn't necessarily uh, ready for this because they were working in our head office in Thornhill and used to working in one enclosed environment. So what I want to do really is with our presentation is take us through kind of pre-COVID. In other words, what did we do with our business applications to provide for a distributed workforce uh, or remote workforce? And, uh, and then once uh, I finish with that, then I'm going to take us into what we had to adopt and, and take on uh, based on the pandemic coming um, uh, in early March. So as Jamie mentioned, with our Sage 300, our financial system was already deployed with remote desktop services. And so uh, we were able to have that accessible literally wherever we wanted to be. But Sage CRM, it was a web-based application and we obviously deployed that uh, externally to our users. But Sage CRM really ended up being all things customer to us. So all of the information that we we had uh, on our customers, their ERP profiles, all of the applications that they used, uh, all of the third-party add-ons, their environment, their servers, all of that information was there. So this allowed us to be able to provide the information on our customers to all of our users in all of our locations. But we chose Sage CRM to do that because it's an application or really a development platform that allowed us to take uh, CRM and build out all of the elements, the functional capabilities that we needed to deploy to all of our users, uh, what is now um, multiple offices coast to coast across Canada, into the US and the Caribbean as well. So we built out a lot of capabilities in Sage CRM. That way the information was made available to everybody as a web-based application. We also built out our project management capabilities within CRM. And what we did here was we, uh, under our customer profile, we could create multiple projects. Within each project, we could actually create various tasks and assign resources to each of those tasks. So everybody knew what their role and responsibility was within each of the projects. We also have each of our consultants and technicians record their time against that so we understand what our, our cost is on a project. And it also facilitates our support billing as well. But we also built an application that takes all of our time details from Sage CRM and pulls it together to allow for billing process, which then integrates to Sage 300. So that piece of middleware facilitates a very quick billing process for us. Of course, all of our support cases are managed within Sage CRM as well. So whether you email, call in, or, or visit our support portal, the information that's gathered through that is automatically entered into Sage CRM and it then goes to our support triage team who actually determines who's going to be the best resource to be able to manage that issue for you and uh, and then uh, expedites the their uh, investigation on the issue itself our management team though has a dashboard which allows us to be able to actually track our service level agreements. So if you have a support agreement with us and therefore expect their response on the support issue to turn around quickly, we, um, uh, as we're allocating resources to it, if one is getting closer to the, the limits on our service level agreement, we can actually have that identified on the dashboard and therefore it gets escalated. So many things we've done with Sage CRM to be able to facilitate our service delivery for our clients. We've also utilized the information that we have in Sage CRM and pushed that out to a web interface to allow our customers to access the customer portal. Uh, 
And this customer portal was designed to be able to provide our customers with information that's important to them. They can actually do an inquiry and look up uh, their support cases and see what the status and progress of that case is. They can actually log a new case here as well. If they have uh, outstanding invoices and, and want to get a copy of the, the service invoices from our firm, they can actually go in and down see their outstanding invoices and download a copy of that. They can go in and update their profile information. Therefore, we end up having the most accurate information in our CRM system on their organization as well. And if you are a customer care membership, uh, uh, participant, then you can access your information on your support agreement uh, in the portal as well. And you also have access to all of your BAS contacts that you work with, whether on your projects uh, or your account managers. We also leverage Sage CRM to build out additional functionality for our finance team. And this in the area of accounts receivable collections. So we built a product called Sage CRM Collect. And what this allows our team to do is actually identify or view all of the outstanding uh, transactions uh, on a customer's account, be able to take a look at that and send reminders out for payment on these invoices from the system automatically. This way they're not having to drill through each client within the ERP system. They can actually see all this information right from CRM. And when payments are made, they can see that as well. But if we want to be able to record our communication so that we can follow up with clients, if we have a telephone conversation with them, we can actually record those details uh, in CRM so that we can re refer to those uh, at a later time. Or certainly if we have any communications via email, go back and forth, that's something that we can actually log in the system as well. And then at the end, if we simply need to be able to transfer documents to our customers, we can do that right directly from Sage CRM Collect with the click of a button and it will create an email for a client and send out a copy of their current statement and an attachment of all of their outstanding invoices. So it simplifies that collection process and reduces a great deal of time. We've also provided integration to our marketing automation tool, HubSpot, and this is in Sage CRM as well. So if you're using a marketing automation tool and you are tracking uh, all of the communications that you're sending out to your customer base. Uh, in our case, you know, we're sending our webinar uh, invites, we're sending out uh, our blogs, our newsletters, and of course our conference invites as well. Uh, now, your marketing team may have access to that uh, automation tool, but other people in your organization may not. So we built an integration between HubSpot and Sage CRM that allows us to track all of our communications to every individual that has had those sent out to them. So we can actually look up and see the individual and see each of the emails that have actually been sent out to them and track their activity on that. Another cloud application that we introduced into our organization is that of human resources, so an information system for HR and for our payroll. So the cloud-based HR system, again, what we wanted to do is take off the responsibility of our HR administrative team to be able to respond to all the inquiries, and we pushed that back into the hands of our employees across the country. Through employee self-service, it's allowed us to actually uh, allow our employees to update all of their information into the HR system. And of course we can control what they can and cannot update, but also allows them to do things like request personal time off or vacation time. And that is routed through an approval workflow to their supervisors as well. And of course, all of the information around our employees and skill sets is maintained in this system as well. We've had that integrated into our payroll system, so we remove duplicate data entry. And we also provide a payroll, um, uh, the, our payroll stubs through a portal so that any of our employees can actually go back and, and grab a copy of, 
of their payroll stub. And again, all of this was developed with putting the empower or empowering our employees with the ability to, to get this information themselves. So that kind of wraps up the section that I wanted to go over with you with respect to the applications that we've uh, had put in place over the last number of years in our organization to be able to support a distributed or remote environment with, with our employees. So my focus I want to turn to now is actually that of the new systems we had to put in place based on the pandemic coming in. So like us, we're no different than every one of you. We experienced immediate pain points and we um, followed our natural progression that we do with yourself. So if you reach out to us with a problem, we really like to try and go through a specific type of process to understand the pain points and the impact on the business and do a discovery process to understand the functional needs, non-functional needs, your process, inputs, outputs, all of these things impact the solution. So we did that with ourselves. And the pain points that we in uh, that influenced us the most was our inability to meet face-to-face, -face, uh, not only internally, but with our customers. And probably at least 75% of our workforce would meet face-to-face -face with our clients on a regular basis, and all of a sudden we weren't allowed to, and this was a very difficult adjustment. And all, no doubt some of our business was done, um, this way, but we had to make sure everyone in our organization had the ability to do this. We also uh, struggled with being able to manage our own internal uh, schedules for our resources and how could we facilitate that better. Even the simplest thing like getting approvals back from our, our customers on new projects or on project documentation, this became a real problem and we needed to address that. And then, of course, uh, our distributed finance team, taking them out of our head office and now having all of them work from home. So looking at collaboration, again, Jamie covered off the fact that we introduced Microsoft Teams, GoToMeeting, and SharePoint. But to truly meet our communication and collaboration requirements, uh, tools like GoToMeeting were absolutely critical for face-to-face -face meetings with clients. And we implemented this tool and provided a license to every individual in our organization to be able to do this. The one nice tool about GoToMeeting is the fact that it does allow people to call in. So if they can't remote in and use audio capabilities within their, their workstation or laptop, they still could call in with the phone. And it allowed us to present, um, you know, uh, and, and do our demonstrations, uh, actually show our proposals, all of those things, as well as see the faces of individuals and the people that we've been working with over the last number of decades. So this really helped to facilitate that type of communication. And then internally, the collaboration done with Microsoft Teams for internal video calls, we spend a lot of time collaborating internally. So when we have a discovery meeting with, your, with yourself and go through a particular challenge that you're facing and how we can go about automating that, we spend a lot of time in the background at that point in time looking at alternative solutions, making sure that we are gonna bring forward the right solution. So between our account uh, managers, our solution engineers, our consultants and technicians, we have to do a lot of collaboration together. So this team was great, not only to be able to uh, facilitate the calls and the collaboration um, and seeing each other, but also to be able to collaborate with documentation as well and the chat feature. So this gave us the ability to actually build out uh, responses in shared documents as well. And of course, the document management tool behind all of that is SharePoint. And SharePoint, we moved away from a, sh uh, a file shared tool to SharePoint, and this gave us much greater control and accuracy on our documents. But with Microsoft Teams as that user interface in the beginning, in the front, that way our tools didn't, or our employees didn't have to 
uh, learn two applications. They're using Teams for collaboration and access to all of these documents as well. We decided to go one step further. And as I mentioned to you earlier, Sage CRM is really all things customer. So that being the case, we made sure all of the, uh, the documents that relate to customer projects and opportunities, their evaluation of products, everything that they um, was relating to the customer, we provided a gateway from Sage CRM to the documents in SharePoint. So you can see here uh, under, as an example, we go under a project in Sage CRM. We can actually take a look at all of the documentation that the entire project team is working on and it's accessible for everyone. So they don't have to leave CRM to go to either Teams or back to SharePoint. Anything uh, that they need access to is right there and available to them in Sage CRM. Then when we turn to our workforce, I'm sure everyone's experienced this. We need somebody to do something, but we're not sure who's the right person to do it. Well, we are running into that problem. And again, this is a problem that we had before COVID hit, but we were looking to solve it. And of course, this really put the crunch on us as well. So we added a scheduler to coordinate our resources and right within Sage CRM. So as issues came in and we needed to schedule appointments for our consultants and technicians to be able to uh, address for our clients, we can simply now go into their calendar, identify a time when we need to address the issue and say, I need this type of resources, who is available? All of this is integrated with, with our Outlook uh, calendars. So it pulls availability from these resources, those people that have the appropriate skill sets that we need, and it lets us know who's available, and we can simply create the appointment for them to address the issue. This was a huge time saver and, um, and obviously brings a lot of coordination through our service delivery team. Now, looking at the issue with respect to uh, signatures on documents, again, whether proposals or project documents, project plans, um, uh, change requests, whatever that might be, the problem we ran into is, is we would send over a document uh, to our customer and say, we need your signature on this. Please review and approve, scan it, uh, print it off, scan it, and email it back to us. Well, Certainly in the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of people didn't have printers in place, let alone scanners. So this became a real difficult uh, situation for us to be able to continue to move things forward for our customers. So we implemented DocuSign and DocuSign really is it's an application that allows you to digitally sign documents. So what we would do is take our documents and identify where we needed customer signatures or initials in the document, and then initiate and send that document out to the client. They would get an email notification, go to the website, it would pull up the document, they could review everything, and then initial or sign the document as required, and then complete the process. And then after that, both parties, being ourselves and our customer, would have uh, a copy of that signed document. The one thing or one reason why we went with DocuSign over other applications available is the simple fact that DocuSign has an API, API that allows us to interface DocuSign in Sage CRM. Again, as you can see, we're bringing all things operational into Sage CRM. And so we could initiate the DocuSign process right from Sage CRM. Uh, I already covered this off, but again, remote desktop services for the access to Sage 300. Uh, this is really what uh, allowed our accounting staff to move into their own home offices and be able to access that particular application. So looking at other issues that we ran into, this is probably the one that I think the majority of our clients have um, been challenged with. 
And uh, we, uh, the phone, in fact, was ringing off the hook with people as they distributed their uh, accounting group uh, into their home offices. All of a sudden now we can't walk down the hall with a stack of papers and put it on the desk of the controller and say, hey, you know, here's all the invoices that we have with all the backup that require payment. Can you go through and approve these? That process just wasn't available anymore. So we needed a way to be able to automate that accounts payable process. And for some organizations, they may have to take that back further earlier in the process with a system that would allow you to raise a purchase order requisition that could be reviewed and approved by a manager and then sent through for a purchase order to be sent to a vendor. And then, of course, that process flowing through into the accounts payable process and payment process. But in this particular case, we are looking for an AP automation tool simply to allow us to receive an invoice, scan it, add it into the workflow, and route it to the appropriate person with the workflow to review and approve or deny that particular invoice, and then have that come back and integrate with Sage 300 and and complete the data entry process and ready that transaction for payment. So that's what you're, you're looking for, something that will manage that complete flow from end to end. And we have a number of different solutions that are available. So if this is something that is still challenging you, and again, um, Jamie kind of alluded to the fact that, um, you know, there's a lot of things that were done in the beginning, the original spike of the pandemic, and those were kind of uh, 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 gap solutions. In other words, we got to do something immediately. And then now we're, we're kind of looking at it and saying, ah, I think we can do better. So we're actually seeing a second wave of inquiries for these types of solutions. But for AP automation or procurement to, to pay type solutions, we have actually six different ones from norming, Pacific Tech, uh, from Snap AP, uh, Alltech Doc Link, and uh, Sage AP Automation, and uh, InfoDynamics. So these various solutions do different things. So if this is something that you're interested in. What I suggest is you reach out to your account manager and and uh, request a discovery where we can sit. Uh, in our home office. See, I almost said, sit across the table from me. Can't do that. See, Robert Lavery said I had to let go of things. And the, trust me, after 35 years of doing it, this is difficult to let go of. But um, it's, we can we can coordinate a, a remote uh, or virtual call with you and go through a discovery process and uh, understand specifically your process there, what your needs are, and we can make a recommendation of, of which of those six systems uh, would be the best for you to consider. And last but not least, certainly we introduced uh, EFT for accounts payable, and this particular solution. Uh, allowed us to automatically pay through uh, direct payment through our bank to our vendors. We don't have a lot of vendors, so this wasn't something that we necessarily had in place, but we uh, we needed to um, uh, expedite this process, again, with our remote workforce. So adding EFT just simplified that for us as well. And a, a kind of a bonus gift here is we added a remote desktop scanner into our head office. So if you do not have this capability, I suggest you get this. So as all of our, our checks come in from our customers for services um, into the office, and again, our uh, accounting team being remote at this point in time, this machine allowed us to take all of this, the checks, scan them through, and automatically deposit them into uh, our bank account. This saved a huge amount of time so our accounting people weren't having to travel in, get the checks, and then travel to the bank, stand in line, and go through that regular deposit process. This is a game changer. So something uh, to, to talk to your bank about. 
And last, I just wanted to cover off, uh, those were the solutions that we put in place um, uh, at the pandemic time. And, um, and now, uh, basically what we have on the, on the whiteboard for 2021 is to add in an advanced project management tool that will actually be embedded within SageCRM, but allow us to do greater collaboration with our clients on projects. And also looking at a full document management system that will allow us to move completely towards a paperless environment. So at this point in time, um, that kind of wraps up my presentation and we're open for questions. So we'll kind of open the lines uh, right now and Chuck, uh, if we can I got get some you. questions. Re Remington, the moderator, she's already sent me over four or five while I was offline. So I got a couple here for you already. We got a couple of minutes before we paste it over. Now, this first one here, I think this is to you, but I, I kind of, with these, does it, uh, what is the question? Do these solutions, <clears throat> apologize, does it matter if you have Sage 300 on-prem or Sage 300 cloud for the solution or any of these setups to work? And I and I, I think they're talking about, this is aimed towards you, but I can say that it doesn't matter because wherever you're implementing it, you can install any of these. That That's correct, yeah. And, you know, certainly, um, you know, the cloud or C300 in the cloud allows you to have remote access to that application. That's the benefit there. But no, any of these applications can be installed to your Sage 300 on-premise. Okay, perfect. So basics here are gonna be, if I've got Sage 300 installed on the server, I'm delivering it via remote desktops to my, to, to my employees, I can add and integrate any of these third-party ISV products into it, which is fantastic. Um, Absolutely. They asked me, what does MSP mean? This has gotta be aimed at me, main service provider, just means IT and infrastructure support, nothing to do with Sage 300, it's just what we do. It's what IT guys, we wanna you know, put acronyms and make things fancy. So uh, just means IT guy. Um, do you require handsets for your phones or you just use your computers? Hey, Chuck, I'll let you answer that one, even though it's an IT question. Yeah, well, thank you, Jamie. Uh, this beautiful little device right here <laughs> is it's a Bluetooth um, a device. So in my particular case, I have no cables, which is lovely because as you probably saw during my presentation, I moved my arms quite a bit and um, uh, Joe thinks I'm Italian, but I'm not really Italian. Um, but it, it uh, connects through Bluetooth through to my computer, and and that gives me access to MS Teams or uh, you know go to connect, uh, go to meeting, all of these devices. So perfect. Uh, the key here is I just have to remember to put it back in my charging station at the end of the day so that it doesn't run out of battery the next day. That's right. So any of these solutions, you get an app that installs on your computer. Uh, all you have to do is remember either A, to have the app turn on when you first turn your computer on. If you don't, it's not going to ring or open the app to make sure that it rings. And then you can start making calls, dialing out, receiving calls on the handset or uh, receiving or making calls out. You can use it either for calls. You can use it for Teams meetings. You can do it for, for web, you know, anything like that. Perfect. Uh, can you access Microsoft Team files offline? Okay. Yes and no. I'll answer this one. The answer is yes, and the answer is no. Through Microsoft Teams and the app that you install, it's a portal into online. So it does not do offline within Microsoft Teams. SharePoint will allow you to do that, though. I'll also say this, though. In this day and age, pretty much everybody's going to be online. If you are going to be working offline, you can also do things. And if it's the company shares by department, that's going to be Teams or SharePoint. If it's going to be your personal, we give everybody a OneDrive. So it's to one terabyte of storage for everybody to put your own device uh, files in. You put that on your local machine, that synchronizes. Those are completely available to you offline. SharePoint, you can synchronize offline. Microsoft Teams, unfortunately, no, not quite yet. Uh, do you use a VPN when you connect to the office? No, we do not. We use multiple different ways of two-factor authentication. Pretty much every one of them has to do with, I want you to go to a web page, type in the web page, put in your username and press connect, and it just allows you to continue from there with some form of two-factor authentication and an SSL cert so that you got you know secure communication back and forth, but no VPNs. We don't want to install stuff on people's computers. We want to make this easy for them, but we do want to make it secure. And what does Microsoft Teams and SharePoint cost? I'll, um, it's not a simple one. I really apologize. 
it's super cheap because it's included in the office and M365 licensing. If you're getting anything that's over $6 or 40 cents, including your email, it's in there. You just have to implement it. Talk to your IT about that. And who do I can contact at Bass? Whom can I connect with for DocuSign, Chuck? Yeah, so we're we're actually not a reseller of DocuSign. So really the easiest thing uh, to do would be to connect or go to the DocuSign website and, and subscribe to that service there. But if you do want to integrate DocuSign with an application like Sage CRM, like we've done, then that definitely that's something that we can we can help you with. And again, either contact your account uh, manager um, and and they'll get uh, Zainab and the Sage uh, CRM team involved. That's the answer we wanted. Contact your Bass account manager. Okay, I apologize. There was one more. You don't have the uh, any uh, idea of what's the cost of the check scanner? No, unfortunately, I don't. And contact um, your account manager, and he can find out for you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. We're over time. I apologize. We'll pass this back to Remington. Chuck, as always, it's beautiful to see you. You as well, Jamie. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone, thank you. for joining us. Uh, thank you, Jamie and Chuck, for presenting. If you did submit a question and we were unable to get to it, a BAS um, member will reach out to you directly. At this time, we're going to take another 10-minute break and rejoin at 2.50 for the next session, which will be BAS Management Consulting. <laughs>